right, well, welcome to this TDR special issue on contemporary German theater. To introduce today's chat, I would like to introduce Mr. Richard Schechner. Thank you, I'm the editor of TDR and I have with me the two uh, co-editors of this special issue, Matt Cornish and David Sabrin, and a lead contributor to the issue, uh, Professor Christopher Baum. Briefly, I will introduce the three of them. Uh, Matt Cornish is uh, an associate professor at uh, uh, Ohio University in the United States. Uh, he's of a th uh, theater history and interdisciplinary arts. Uh, he's uh, the author of Performing Unification, History and Nation in the German Theater after 1989. And he's editor of Everything and Other Performance Text from Germany and uh, co-editor of Post-Dramatic Theater and Forum. So an expert on German theater. Uh, David Saverin of the Graduate Center of City University of New York is the Vera Mary Maury Roberts Distinguished Professor of Theater and Performance and a specialist in 20th and 21st century theater. He wrote a definitive book on the Worcester Group. Uh, he's also uh, the author of seven other books, including Highbrow, Low Down Theaters, Jazz and the Making of the New Middle Class. He's the winner of the Joe Calloway uh, Prize for Performance. Um, and uh, he's a, a very a brilliant and well-known uh, theater scholar. Christopher Baum is a professor of theater studies and co-director of the Research Center for Glo Global, called Global Disconnect. Um, he uh, uh, has written Decolonizing the Stage, Theatrical Syncretism and Post-Colonial Drama, uh, Pacific Performances, Theatricality and Cross-Cultural cross Encounter in the South Seas, and more recently, um, the Cambridge Introduction to Theater Studies, the, the, the pub, theatrical public spaces, uh, and the globalization of theater and the theatrical networks of Maurice E. Bandenbaum. So it's a very distinguished panel, uh, the two editors of the issue and a leading uh, contributor to it. So let me just throw out in, in, in reading the issue, some things that struck me and then uh, give it over to you. One of the things that struck me most is that all the, although the issue is titled German theater and it is German theater, it's much more than German theater. In other words, German theater also comprises people who are not usually by non-Germans regarded as Germans, uh, immigrants, uh, uh, people from uh, Turkey, there's somebody, there's an Israeli featured in the, in the issue and so on. So I would like you to explain a German theater as a cultural rather than national uh, operation, which I think is what you're uh, dealing with. Uh, also, the extraordinary commitment that the German public and the German state has in live performance and in theater in particular. This is astonishing to an Anglophone like myself. Uh, we're scrambling in the United States for a pittance of support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and New York State Council of the Arts, et cetera, et cetera. While German support by the German uh, national and state uh, bureaus is, is enormous. Even more important perhaps is the fact that people go to the theater in Germany as a, as a way of engaging in public discourse. Uh, and, and that is not, you know, that's sometimes what happens in the United States, but it's, it's much more, much more engaged. So I'd like you to discuss this, uh, phenomenon and, and specifically, I'd like Christopher, of course, to talk about anything he wants, but the, his own essay on post-fictional performance. In other words, the, the, uh, let's say for a, a non-expert like myself, I think of uh, Brecht, who you talk about as not being as important as he used to be, but he's he, we think of Brecht and uh, epic theater and a, a theater that deals with, uh, re quote, real political issues. But when you're talking about post-fictional performance, you're talking about something else again. And so I'd like you to expound on that. So with that kind of uh, broad... Uh, 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 query, set of queries. I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, 
and listen and learn from you about this very, very marvelous issue. By the way, I, I happen to have it here. I, the cover is very nice, uh, you know, big fish. Uh, oh, it's going in and out. But at any rate, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very strong issue and I'm very pleased to have it. So David, Matt, Christopher, please take over. Thank right. you so much. Thank, thank you so David, much, why don't you go first <laughs> for, for that for that great introduction. We're I know David and I were just so pleased to be able to work on this issue. Uh, it's been a long time coming, um, and has really has, has sparked a great collaboration and a, and a great friendship too. I think, uh, and I'm so glad that we're we're joined by Chris, uh, whose essay on post-fictional theater, I think is one of the major co contributions to the to the issue and also somebody who knows uh, very deeply the German theater and has lived there for a long time. So I, I think that uh, I just was really glad when when Chris agreed to join us. Now, um, I think your, your first question, Richard, on the kind of what is German is a really good question and a really a really hard one to answer. You say it's it's almost more of a cultural phenomenon than a national phenomenon, um, and I think that uh, and and uh, you know welcome responses from David and Chris as well. It's almost more an institutional phenomenon. The idea of German theater, uh, which David and I talk a lot a little bit in that introduction, than it is a, a cultural phenomenon, which is to say it is partly national because of the nation's support, not just. The, the state, the German nation, but uh, Swiss and Austrian nations, um, that their support for for the theater is what kind of makes it German in a way. It's uh, the the deep and ongoing support uh, that that is given to the theater there, which does help. There's kind of like a circular process between attendance and the state's contribution that that helps to make it a part of the culture in Germany in a, in a way that it isn't in the United States. I always I always talk about the fact that I'll have conversations with people who you would you would imagine as perfectly regular people and they have very deep ideas about specific directors. Uh, I remember a babysitter that I, I had when I was in Berlin um, who had no particular connection to the theater but had a very strong opinion on the director Ulrich, Ulrich Rasha. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you just would never expect in, in the like United. a sports star. Right? Yeah, <laughs> a very negative. I'll add for maybe Chris and Chris and David want to want to talk about Raj. Raj is not in the issue at all, but has a has a very particular aesthetic, which she very much disliked. Um, uh, but still went to go see his work. Right? I mean, it's it's right. it's really an, an incredible phenomenon. Um, so that I'll, that'll start us off, and maybe I'll I'll invite David to to uh, contribute as well to, to jump and, and in. Christopher, yes, David. and Chris, of course, too. I, yeah, yeah. Well, I I certainly second what Matt said, and I think so much of it has to do with the institutional support. But um, I mean, I think of German theater in part as what is covered by the website Nachkritik. Um, and they, even to say that they cover German language theater, I mean, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, also Luxembourg, since German is an official language of both Luxembourg and Belgium. Yeah, Belgium, so, I was thinking Milo Rao, is Swiss, he works in Belgium, but he's in the German aesthetic. Yeah, so um, there's- And, and don't uh, forget self to roll. I mean, it's also German speaking. <laughs> right. so, so, so there is a great deal of um, crossing of national borders, but for me, so much of this comes down to questions of nationalism. And the fact that nationalism is sort of a dirty word in Germany, um, or at least nationalist sentiment is really suspect in a way that it is not, I think, in France, for example. And um, obviously this has to do with German history, but I, I think that, uh, that sort of this uh, different understanding of nationalism and a different notion of national identity is really important to this. 
Um, and the fact that, yeah, the German language is important, but there's so much German theater that is not in German, but that is proudly German. Mm -hmm. So that's... Chris? Yeah, um, it, yeah it's, I, I would agree that, um, you know, German theater is, in the, in the first instance, a, a linguistic question, that, that German theater is, is where German is spoken in the theater, okay, and that can be all these places that, that David's mentioned. Um, so, and that, and they are interconnected, but they're interconnected institutionally, and that's what Richard was saying at the beginning through this commitment to public funding. And I think the first thing that I would emphasize here is that, that the funding for, for German theater in any of the German speaking countries is not from the nation state, okay? Mm -hmm. It's from the municipality or perhaps from the federal state, but normally not from the sort of the, the top level, like say it is in the UK. Okay, so, so what is the federal state? Because in America, U.S. the federal state would be the yeah yeah I know it's a, it's a te it's a terminological question. In, in right. German, you talk about the Länder. Those are the the individual states in the in in the comparable country. to New York or or yeah, Illinois right. or something like okay, that. So, in the so the bulk of the bulk of funding in Germany comes either from the city or right. from that next level, the state level. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, it's so there is very little in a sense. Uh, national uh, interference uh, in 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 German theatre. It's there, it has changed a little bit in the last twenty years with a with a, there is now a Ministry of Culture which does actually fund some theatre, but it's nowhere near on the level that the that the cities, towns, and and the individual states do. So I why think why do they why do they fund it? What's their rationale? Let's say I'm not a theatre goer, but right. I'm a legislator or administrator. What's the yeah. rationale? We this pick up the garbage, we support the theater. What's the rationale? Exactly. You have to go back in history. Um, and I and it's and, and, and this is an institutional, really inter interesting institutional question. There was a big movement, of course, around Europe and not just in, in the German speaking world, to, which basically tried to um, position the theater as a public service. Okay. You find oh. it in France, you find it in England too. It just they didn't really take on so much. Okay, this is this, is this idea that German that theater is a public service, right? Like like the gas and the water, uh, right. and so on. Okay, it's it's a discursive. It's 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 a move, right? But it 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 creates a kind of discursive space for legitimation, and it 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 is taken up in different countries in Europe in different ways, but most strongly in the German speaking countries. And this is where it gets really interesting. Um, it starts in the early 20th century. It starts to pick up speed in the Weimar Republic. And it's, it, it's, it comes to completion under the Nazis. Okay, The Nazis are the ones who turn all the city theaters into publicly funded theaters. Okay, Before that, there were a mixture of privately funded, half public, half, and so on. It was, it was a real mixed bag. The, the, the Nazis basically change all that they, they all become uh, publicly funded by the cities, and there's a but there's a very interesting thing that you, you ask. Well, how do they, how do the cities afford it? Right? I mean, this is a lot of money. The Nazis changed the tax system so that all company tax goes to the city, okay? Not not to the not to the uh, uh, to the state level, okay? So that the cities in Germany still and that net was never changed have a much broader tax base. And, and they can use that money to support cultural institutions, not just theater, but cultural institutions more generally. And so this is one of the, the interesting moves in the 20th century, um, which, as I say, took place in different countries. You know, it's the, it's, it's the identical discourse, but it takes on a different institutional form in, the, in these different countries. And it's sort of German speaking countries all, in a sense, shared this and they never, they never went back on it. You know, it was one of the, uh, the, the more fortuitous uh, legacies of the uh, of a very uh, less than fortuitous period in German history. Mm. Thank you for that correction, Chris. That's uh, uh, that it's a state, right? It's a say it's the state or the city that that funds the theater, like Berlin, as both a city and a state. That's a city the state, yeah. That's that does both, Berlin. yeah. Yeah. And part of the reason why there are so many professional state supported theaters in Berlin, because Berlin was at one point two states uh, belonging yeah. to two different countries. Yeah. And of course, part of this goes all the way back to the 18th century, um, as well as the 19th century, with the founding of these national theaters in different city states like Hamburg, uh, where Lessing worked. Mm. So, by the, the city, the, the actual, the national theaters are an interesting case because 
you know, Germany has had several, and you know, normally you have one national theater, right, for, for, the, for the one nation. Germany had seven, I think, or eight, um, but they were essentially court theaters. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were court theaters. They called themselves national theaters. Um, and then in 1918, after the First World War, all the court theaters were turned into state theaters, right? what we'd call in German now Staatstheater. Okay, and they're the best funded theaters. Uh, and and they, they, are, they kind of represent this sort of national theater idea. Um, but but the national theater is, is, is a different discussion. It's an interesting one in its own right. I mean, my favorite example is Croatia, which I think has five national theaters. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to give you an idea of what, what this, this word can mean in, in different cultural contexts. So let's turn from this institutional question to specific, specific theaters and, and, and trends that you uh, feature in the issue. I don't know where to begin, post -fiction, what's post-fictional theater or what goes on at the Gorky Theater or Ribbony Protocol or you know, Gob Squad or wherever, or the, the heritage of Schiller that uh, David talks about. So I don't, wh wherever you want to begin, but uh, what makes this strongly supported theater interesting as uh, aesthetics, as politics, as social action, whatever, what, what's good about the contemporary German theater and how does that relate to what's in this issue of TDR? Well, what you've just said, that list you is just an example of how heterogeneous uh, German theater is. I mean, also on an organizational level, Rimini Protocol is not a city theater or a state theater. Okay, they're a privately funded uh, theater group, independent right. theater group. Yeah. Um, and, and, and if you did this issue 20 years ago, it would look totally different. I mean, German theater has changed a lot in 20, the last 20 years. I mean, Seriously, yeah, it's 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 much more heterogeneous. It's culturally heterogeneous. You you it, normal twenty years ago, you'd only ever see her, hear German being spoken on stage. And today, it's quite common to hear English, but also Arabic or Turkish, you know, in these city theaters. Not that the audience always likes this. I mean, there's, there's resistance right. to it, but it is certainly become much more heterogeneous. I think the issue shows that. You know. So since you're talking, uh, Chris, about this, why don't we start with what you're dealing with, post-fictional. What is, who, who are the exemplars of post-fictional theater? What is post-fictional theater? Then let's move to some of the other mm. core uh, uh, tendencies or groups or individual artists, directors that are featured in this issue. Well, post-fictional theater, I actually link it to one particular theater, but it's it goes beyond that. It, that's just my angle in this article. I link it to the Munich Kammerspiele, where I live, the Munich's where I live. And this is what, certainly one of the most innovative, there's been one of the most innovative theaters uh, over the last 20 years, or really quite consistently uh, since the in, in, Intendant or the artistic director, Frank Baumbauer. Um, but the last year, the two terms um, have seen an, e an even an really an attempt to uh, integrate much more independent theater into the ensemble and repertoire system. Okay, uh, normally state and, and city theaters are basically have a, an ensemble and a repertoire, you know, which they which they play. Um, what happened in the Munich Kammerspiele under Matthias Lienthal is that he really brought in, in independent theater groups and artists. And one of the things that is characterizes independent theater work is an interest in what I call post-fictional theater, which basically means there's no attempt to, to create a fictional world. Yeah. There's no attempt for the performers to be in, uh, inhabiting uh, roles. Okay. It's 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 um it's it's in a sense framing theater in a different way. It's saying, well, yeah, we can use theater to tell fictional stories. We've been doing it for the last two and a half thousand years, but you can actually. Theater is actually a medium, yeah. We can like TV. You can do, you can tell other, you can do other things with it. So let's let's engage with some some of these really pressing social issues. And uh, and and I mean, and the, the the article basically outlines three different groups or artists who look at different issues. Um, for instance, the Rimney Protocol example. They basically do a a production about Hitler's Mein Kampf, about the book. Okay, so you've got a group of people on stage. None of them are actors. They're, they're lawyers and there's a rap artist and and they're basically talking about the book yeah they're talking about their relationship to the book okay so there's no way any any of that can be framed fictionally there's no there's no role playing going on and this is mm -hmm. absolutely characteristic for many protocols work 
they do other stuff as well, but that's characteristic for their work. So, and they and they are, and, and there's, a, there's, there's another uh, uh, production I talk about, which was directed by Lula Arias, who's Argentinian, but works in the German theater. So that's another example of this sort of mixing that's going on, you know, which looks at the, at, at the experience of a Syrian refugee who basically performs himself uh, in this production, basically his waiting, his, his performance of waiting, his performance of waste, if you like, his wasted life. And you see him every night and every night it's another day in his in 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 the in his the way his life has been wasted in the German refugee bureaucracy. So, so it, it, is it a different from or similar to Carol Martin's idea of theater of the real? Oh, there's there's, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of of course a lot of intersection. Yeah, she's she, she's documented that movement, and it's and I'm saying it's by no way is I'm claiming it's specific to German theater. What I do try and argue in the article though is that there's an interesting institutional link. Yeah. But that by doing this amount of uh, post-fictional theater in an institution which is basically designed, yeah, which really designed to produce uh, 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 fictional works by actors, yeah, uh, that's what they're there for, that's what they're paid for, that's what the whole infra technical infrastructure is designed to do, and then you come along, you do all this sort of work, it becomes really challenging, and it's it challenged, and it ultimately led to to Matthias Lilienthal's uh, contract not being renewed. Yeah, I mean, there was a real resistance to that on the part of the audience. How so, is it different than Lehman's post-dramatic theater? Yeah, 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 no, it's, it's definitely, it's, I mean, it's a, if you like, it's a subset of what Lehman talks about, but he doesn't even talk about post-fictional theater very much because there wasn't actually that much of it going on, I don't think, at least not in Germany uh, in 1999 when he wrote the book right. or he published the book. Um, so it's not it, he does talk about those issues a little bit, but it's it's I think it's definitely a that what, what, what as I say what Carol Martin talks about, of course, she's documenting all these various examples. What I'm saying is it's coming into the mainstream theater big time, yeah, right. And what does that mean? Right. what how does that challenge this whole uh, technical apparatus? What, what about Peter Weiss's stuff about the Nuremberg trials? Is yeah, yeah. That, well, that's documentary theater. That has its place. That has its place in German theater. I'm not saying it's, but it, it, it was a, 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 a movement. Yeah, that was a movement in the 1960s, right. which had a beginning, a middle and an end, and then it stopped. I mean, it, right. it literally stopped. And then, and, and, uh, and so post-fictional theater, as I say, I'm trying to make an institutional argument rather than sort of uh, uh, looking at it on a phenomenological level and saying, right. what, what does it mean when this kind of work, uh, you know, be becomes center stage? Right. The connection that you make, Chris, that, that I think is really convincing with this is between uh, these productions by RS and Rimini Protocol and what's happening at the institution for what we might say are like non-theatrical events. So hosting, uh, uh, book readings or discussion roundtable discussions with politicians or talking about aesthetic ideas inviting in yeah. philosophers and, and sociologists. Can you talk a little bit about how that's also changed the institutions and how that's connected with what these theater groups are doing? Yeah, well, what, what the, I, I sort of show statistically that there are more and more of these events taking place, which are also by no means, you know, fictional. So, yeah, they're, they're, that's what I'm saying. It's it's trying to reimagine theater, I think, as a medium, yeah, where you can do all sorts of things with it. You can you can put on conferences, you can do readings, you can, yeah, it's it's the you know, in TV they talk about the two divisions, entertainment and information. Yeah. Previously, theater was only ever entertainment, or, or the Germans would say it was art, but whatever you want to call it, yeah, but didn't really have an in, an information section. The information section is now actually becoming more and more important and right. it's what they call the fifth division or whatever you want to call it it's it you know it's, it's been statistically analyzed now because there's so much of it going on and that's quite interesting you go to the theater for completely different reasons now you yeah? know you might go along to hear a reading by your favorite author or a, a, a public intellectual or yeah. or whatever yeah um so and, david you know. let's uh, what about some of the other things that are in the in the issues so there's this uh, very important article by chris about uh you know, post-fictional. Uh, what are some of the other key uh, movements or artists or theaters in in Germany now? You 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 write how when you came to Berlin the first time and you were you know your eyes were literally opened to something that you had not 
expected or experienced before? Well, I mean, part of that simply has to do with the scale of um, the German theater, which is um, <clears throat> almost inconceivable, I think, uh, in the United States. But I, I was thinking also about what Chris was saying and about, I think one of the things that really interests me is work that is post-fictional, but fictional. In other words, that presents itself as a fiction. And in a way, and I'm thinking specifically, for example, of um, Yael Ronan's work at the Gorky. Um, and the way that it's, it's framed both as fiction, um, in other words, you know, this is a story, but there's also the facticity of, you know, here I am, a Swedish Roma performer who is presenting to you a Swedish Roma performer and other Roma performers. So, um, and, and I think part of that is done in a way uh, as a kind of challenge, because of course, so much of what is presented as first in the first person singular is obviously not true. Um, and I think that, that there is a great deal of play in Yael Ronan's work um, with sort of the, the notion of truth and fiction um, and with the self, of course, and with community, all of these things, which I think are uh, problematized in, in most of her work are problematized in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. and, and people are consistently misreading or were consistently misreading Ronan's work. They were not seeing it as fictional in many ways. Like if you look at the way people respond to productions like Roma Arme, they want to read the people on stage as being those people. Uh, and I wonder if this isn't behind a little bit of Ronan's turn towards fictional worlds. So the article in TDR by Maria Litvin is specifically on Roma Arme. Um, but more recently, in the last year or two, Ronan has been putting on plays, uh, mm -hmm. plays that have characters in them. Uh, she has one that is subtitled almost a musical uh, performance. So how does this relate to another article in the issue, the one from post-migrant post to post-human? So uh, that's an article by Priscilla uh, Lane. And can you, how does that, that seems to mesh in with this a little bit? Uh, how, does, how does that uh, uh, relate? Priscilla, um, uh, who's, a, who's a German studies scholar, uh, she is writing about one artist in particular, um, uh, Simone Didi Aivi, who is working in this independent scene. Um, and in part, and Simone uh, is a relatively, I would say like mid period, she's not right at the beginning like Gob Squad, um, but she's not really young either. And you'll find her in spaces that are presenting these kinds of, uh, uh, mostly presenting these kinds of post fictional productions that Chris is talking about. For example, I saw a more recent production uh, by this artist. She's a she's black German. So she was she's black and she was raised in Germany, born and raised in Germany, um, where she cooked food on stage and talked about the recipes and the way the recipes come from a particular, her own particular history of being uh, both uh, having an African father and a, and a uh, German mother. Uh, so I think, I, and she's been produced, she pr has been produced by a number of these different kinds of houses uh, that are doing this kind of work. So David, you write about Herbert Fritsch as one of the uh, most notable directors in Germany. So that's uh, at a it's a different kind of genre than the independent theater. So could you talk a little bit about Fritsch and these directors? Because we we think again in the Anglophone theater uh, theater we think of you know Peter Brook recently passed away classical, but we also uh, uh, Robert Wilson, Richard Foreman, you know the the uh, pantheon of avant garde uh, directors. I have a feeling that Fritsch and the German directors are a, a bit different than this. 
Uh, and could could you uh, speak a little bit about about him and about other notable directors? Although actually, I think that Richard Foreman is perhaps more like many of these directors. Um, I mean, in that Fritsch, like Foreman, um, in a way starts with the scene design. I mean, he's a designer, so um, his work is very much based in the um, in images. Um, at the same time, he has developed a, a very particular idiosyncratic kind of farce that comes out of his collaboration with uh, especially a fairly small group of actors. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing about the work of people like Fritsch um, or Ulrich Rasha um, or Talheimer um, is that it's very, very conceptual. It's so conceptually driven. And for me, that is one of the really interesting things about it, that it makes me really try to figure it out and to try to understand exactly how, I mean, most, so many of these directors use classic plays as the basis of their work. And so it becomes a question of, well, what does the misanthrope, um, what does the misanthrope mean today? What does it mean if we contemporize the misanthrope? Um, which is, of course, uh, I mean, thinking about how Richard Foreman did the same thing with Don Juan in Central Park mm -hmm. uh, a number of decades ago. So I, I think it's this sort of contemporization of the classics that is really important and, and in a very conceptual way. So let me ask you a, a, a different kind of question to any of you. In Anglophone theater, in American theater particularly, LGBTQ plus and identity and diversity, POC, people of color. These are really important matters which are publicly uh, discussed, uh, enacted, et cetera. There's one essay in the issue about uh, queer uh, opera. Otherwise, it's not a major theme in, in, in this issue. There are obviously lots of uh, things in the issue about diversity, uh, African, Israeli, et cetera, Turkish. So, but what about this, uh, uh, you know, this real concern in an American performance, especially, but also in, 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 in British, which is it similar in Germany? Or are these matters important beyond the opera? Or is it a, a question? Uh, are these questions uh, that are brought in? Is there a great deal of, uh, gender and uh, orientation and uh, 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 people of color uh, activism in the performances or, or what? Well, there's certainly been a movement in German theater for the last 10 years to try and include more people of color, I mean, on stage, you know, as actors, you know? I mean, German theater definitely had a deficit there. There's just absolutely no doubt about it. It was a, a very much a, um, a, white, <laughs> a white medium, if you want to call it, for lack of a better word. And um, I mean, that, that has to do with de demographics, of course, but, but, but there's also been a lot of agitation going on. And there's also, I think, you know, just there are just more actors now coming through, coming out of the acting schools and you're seeing them on stage. And um, there's been some quite uh, heated debates on this question. Um, what I'm seeing in Munich at the moment is really a kind of, yeah, just more and more diverse acting ensembles and you know, the way they cast them now is, is is just, you know, seems to be fairly arbitrary. I mean, which is good. I mean, they're not they're not casting them for skin color if you want to, for, for, you know, as as has been the case in the opera always, you know, in the opera, it doesn't doesn't matter what you look like as long as you can hit the high C. I mean, audiences will- What about LGBTQ plus? Mm, I don't know, guys, is it? It doesn't seem What's to me that? Let's turn to David here. He's He's yeah. got some very specific <laughs> well, thoughts on this. Yeah, first of all, I, I mean, I find, first of all, race does not exist as a legal category in Germany. 
So that when we talk about, I mean, so what exactly then would might black theater mean in Germany? And what I find interesting and peculiar is the way that so many German artists have taken over the basically the American language of identity politics and sort of try to overlay it onto the German scene. And there are times when it works fairly neatly, but um, fundamentally, I think that the American situation is so profoundly different that I'm not sure it's it's sort of terribly useful to think in these terms. And I'm thinking specifically sort of race, ethnicity. Um, sexuality, I, I, that's a, that's another complicated issue, um, in part because um, there's a long history. I mean, there is plenty of what we might call gay or queer performance in Germany, but it tends to be variety entertainment. It's mm -hmm. not Hochkultur, um, Kleinkunst. And um, even though the German theater, I mean, there's so much nudity and so much sex. I mean, I am often surprised by how straight a lot of work feels to me. Right. Um, because of course in the US, I mean, theater has for <laughs> so long been identified almost, I don't want to say primarily as a queer art form. But no, but it's very, very important uh, yes. in, the, in the American theater. And that's, that's just not really a dimension of most German theater. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the Gorky has started foregrounding questions of sexuality and, and other theaters, but. So here's a totally different kind of question. Oh, can, I, can I just that, add quickly one please, thing? Please, please. Um, one of the things I really want uh, this issue to do, one of the things I'm really hoping this issue does is show people that the German theater is not straight white men making regie theater anymore. Okay. That, that is that this director's, this idea that the German theater is a director's theater where somebody like Frank Kastorf makes these somewhat misogynist, enormous plays there is a part of that that still exists, but the theater is so much more than that now. And I think the, that this issue is really highlighting people and groups who are not straight white men. So um, for example, for example, in the issue. Uh, Simone D.D. Ievy, uh, Yael Ronin, um, the queer theater, the, the queer performances at the Komische Oper that uh, that Kevin Clark is talking about. They're just, it's full of these examples. Right. Um, uh, I think that's very important for uh, our listeners or viewers to yeah. look at and know. Thank you. Uh, let me shift something that's also related, that's present but absent, and I, I'm wondering about it. So we we all know about the Wutterpal Dance Theater, you know, Pina Bausch, and and it's and uh, when I first saw her performances, a right of spring, Mueller's Cafe, I was saying, you know. This is dance, of course, but it's not dance in the cunning, you know, you know what I mean? It's it's theatrical, uh, but it's not ballet. So what about the relationship between uh, uh, dance or movement theater or where, whatever you want to call that in that mode and the theater that the issue mainly deals with, which is spoken drama, as they would say in, 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 in China. But there is this other tradition in Germany as well of the of the Tanz theater, not ballet, not modern dance, but this other thing. What, what about that? Oh, you I'll just say really quickly, you're absolutely right, Richard. This is this is a kind of hole in the issue. And had we had the issue been started, had we started working on it, say last year instead of when we did, which was a couple of years before that, there would absolutely be an article on Florentina Holtzinger. I think that well let, um, let's do one and put it in a future issue. Yes, absolutely. So um, tell us about her and it. Chris, I saw you nodding. Do you want to talk about a little bit about Florentina's yeah, work? Yeah, I, I mean, I know I would say more generally, I mean, a, a dance theater or that dance theater or whatever you want to call it, I mean, it's, it's, it's such an autonomous form now. I mean, yes. they have their own festivals, 
Um, they have their own performance spaces and you know, it's highly self-referential. So you'd almost have to do a, a special issue on it. Um, and I think it, they also have different Done. audiences. <laughs> yeah, I, I would argue they have different audiences too. Um, right. and, and so that's why it probably doesn't surprise me that it doesn't feature so much um, in, in, in the issue. But someone like Holzinger, she she's a she kind of crosses that line, you know, that she 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 does perform in the in the in the Stadttheater and so on. Um, but that may also do with the fact that some of her choreographies, the people are not wearing anything, so that obviously does tend to appeal to a wider audience. I think, um, although nudity is not a big thing on gym theater, although in her case it's it's fairly. Um, Pretty obvious, shall we say? Or, <laughs> yeah, nudity is a very obvious costume. Moment, but, <laughs> finish, but it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the English word. Yeah, Hol Holtzinger is a uh, is an Austrian choreographer. She is relatively young. Is she still in her thirties, Chris? In thirties, yeah, late thirties, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, she she did start out in the independent scene and now works mostly with co productions uh, between places like the Volksbühne Berlin and uh, these giant festivals uh, 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 around these around Europe. Uh, and as as Chris mentions, uh, her performers, who are entirely women or femme identifying, are naked from the beginning to the end. Uh, and she puts a lot of different kinds of bodies on stage, and those bodies are doing everything that you can imagine. And if you attended a lot of performance art in the 1970s, as I imagine Richard and David did, um, uh, you probably have an idea of what these performers do on stage. When I say everything, that's roughly what I'm talking about. Right. So it would be good to have an article in TDR about the, or a cluster of articles about this uh, uh, Tom's theater, because beyond Pina Bausch, people in the English speaking world really don't know that much about it, I, I, you know, and, and we should. Uh, I have a right. feeling that Holtzinger will not be produced in New York City anytime soon. Probably a lot of what she does is illegal. Um, I, well, I, I heard that Santos is inviting her to do it in Tallahassee. <laughs> <laughs> Once. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So is there anything else? We're nearing the end of the hour. We're at 12.55. <laughs> is there anything that uh, we would we would like to do? Chris, please. I just, I just want to put on a plug here. Um, we've talked a little bit about the German Directors Theatre, who are the poster boys, and they usually are boys, sometimes now girls, of German theatre. But don't forget the dramaturgs, yeah? It's actually the uh, dramaturgs. Let's talk about that. Dramaturgy is one of those words, when I first heard it, you know, it was one of those uh, Germanic words that kind of came down like a, <laughs> a dramaturg. It's something that you want to take a pill for. Uh, but it's extremely important. Can you explain... N not lessing, not the history of dramaturgy. No, no, its importance in German performance right. now. On the on the one hand, they of course have a lot of input in, what, in what you've called the conceptual side of German theatre. Yeah, they they you know they, they work often very closely with specific directors. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, they are essentially who keep the repertoire and ensemble system going because the repertoire and ensemble system are very complex. Yeah, that's like they're really complex. Uh, um, apparatus that are complex apparatus, and it's and these theaters have three, four, five, six dramaturgs who really work very hard to keep all these moving parts uh, together. So they and, and they are an absolutely essential component of German theater, and it's why it's very difficult to import them into another context because unless you have a repertoire and ensemble system, and most countries don't have that, you, you know, you only you don't you only need part of their function and not their whole function. So that's why I want to say they are a very important part uh, of of this. So that theory. segues into maybe what will be the the final uh, uh, thing to discuss. Something David brought up in his essay, or maybe it was David and Matt in their uh, no, it wasn't David. It was David and Matt in their opening dialogue about the importance of Schiller. Uh, in other words, the and when Schiller is done, Schiller being an 18th century German playwright, uh, when Schiller is done, uh, he's done contemporary. In other words, it's it's not Schiller in an 18th century box, but how does Schiller relate to what's going on now? I assume it would be the same with Goethe or or any of the uh, uh, you know uh, 
older uh, Wojciech, you know, with the uh, older writers. So could you talk about the repertory and the historical depth of uh, the German literary tradition as it pertains to dramaturgy turgy and uh, directing and, and the German theater scene? Start with you, David, because you brought Schiller well, into the conversation. Okay. Um, I mean, one, Germany does not have a Shakespeare, except, of course, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah, they the words, claim he's German. Not, I've heard but, that. <laughs> but, um, and of course, Schiller, Goethe, Buchner are so centrally important to German culture. Um, and I think that there is a sense that this is work because it is important, because this is work that people read in school, that it's something that needs to be constantly reinvented and rethought. Um, I mean, I, I keep going back to the piece, Verruchtes Blut, um, which, and there's a wonderful video of that, um, which was from 2010, 2011. Um, and that was one of the first works to put what was called post-migrant theater on the map, uh, in which, uh, in which uh, a woman teacher is in, in a high school, is teaching a group of young, mainly sort of Turkish Germans and trying to teach them Schiller. And uh, there are various objections to this, and they're not an easy group. Um, and a gun falls out of one of the backpacks, and she ends up teaching Schiller at gunpoint. Oh. Uh, and, and that so clearly, the sort of the connection that that makes between the concerns of Schiller in particular and sort of the, the mission of Schiller and his notion of an educational theater and, uh, and, and a kind of uplifting theater as well. Right. Um, you know, I, if you're, I, I if you're interested in this play, Priscilla Lane, who's a contributor to the issue, did a translation of it that's available online in the Mercurian Journal, the online journal of, of play translation. Is Vatican done often? Well, yeah, spring not, awakening or spring, yeah, not not a lot. I wouldn't say he's he's right. He's mainstream. He, you know, he, every now and then they do spring awakening. Um, and Buchner, yeah, yeah, Buchner definitely, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. and he's, Kleist as well. And Kleist, Buchner and Kleist are all the mainstay. You know, Schiller are the mainstays of the of the classical canon. Absolutely, right, right. Yeah, um, I think. So, but in terms of the performance statistics it's always Shakespeare is, is number one yeah. yes well when I was in Germany I was told on more than one occasion that Shakespeare is actually German mm -hmm. and it was it mm -hmm. was with tongue in cheek but not entirely the, not entirely no there's a there's yeah. a discursive history of that, that you know. the implication yeah. was that the Germans understand Shakespeare as the British and the Americans never will uh, I, I do think that Richard II is better in German than than in the original English. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll make an argument for that. Well, I like my namesake second. I even like third. But <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else that any of you would like to uh, say uh, before we turn this back to Casey? Actually, if um, l let me sort of like Chris, as Chris put in a plug for the dramaturg. Let me put in a plug for musicians and composers. Uh, David Rosner has a wonderful, important piece in the, in the issue that talks about the central position of music in so much what's called spoken theater. And the fact that in so much of this, the composer and musicians are in the room from the beginning of rehearsals. Oh, that's very important. The there is the budget for that kind of thing. Yes. That would be unheard of in the United States, right? Unheard of. Exactly. exactly. And, and I think that this too really changes the character of the work. Mm -hmm. And then so the I final, the final thing, oh, oh, go ahead, Richard. Please. I was going to say the, the the only thing that I would I would add is if you is go go there see the theater there write me write David 
I don't know, Chris, if you want to invite people to write you as well, but I'm always happy to give recommendations on stuff to see if you've got a couple of coming to Munich, I can certainly give you some recommendations. Yeah. Thank you. So the issue is, is a very, very important, very beautiful issue of DDR, blurry as it may look here, uh, on uh, contemporary German theater, edited by Matt Cornish and David Savern, with Christopher Baum having the uh, uh, introductory essay on post-fictional theater. I'm very, very glad that we've had this conversation. It, it uh, taught me a lot. I'm sure when it gets out there, it'll teach a lot of people a lot.